Thank you, Tony. Well, thank you very much for that uh, very kind introduction. Uh, Leo, you know, it's my lucky day to have to, uh, poor old economists like me, have to come up after an accountant. <laughs> an accountant who, uh, you know, auditioned for the Jay Leno show, uh, came second, apparently. But I do want to thank you very much. That was, that was very, very warm. And just a petit mot pour mes amis francophones. Je prononcerai mon discours en anglais aujourd'hui, mais je serai très heureux to respond to your questions in the two languages official at the end. I want to say hi to uh, uh, one of our board members who's here when he was introduced. Uh, Colin Dodds is actually on our board of directors, and Bill Black, who is his predecessor on our board, both here. And so, in effect, this is a performance appraisal. <laughs> so I'll be on my best behavior. I'll do my absolute utmost. Um, happy belated St. Patrick's Day. Big day yesterday, eh? Yeah, you know, I, I, you know I, this weekend I actually thought it would be nice to move to Newfoundland because uh, they actually take the day off. <laughs> uh, they didn't know how to take their holidays seriously. I think that's a pretty good tradition. I hope everybody's feeling fine today. Uh, but I want to speak today about a completely different kind of headache. And that's the prolonged lackluster economic growth that we're experiencing here in Canada and also globally. Canada's economy has been in recovery now for four years, since 2009. And yet economic growth still pales compared to the pre-crisis years. And likewise, the global economy has been growing, on average, roughly two-thirds of the pace of growth that we saw in the four or five years prior to the crisis. So you're right if you think it's unusual to have such weak growth in a recovery. is also unusual for have weak growth for such a prolonged period of time. So you might be asking, it's a, it's a reasonable question to ask, what are we in for? What can we plan on as business people? Well, there are different ways of looking at this. Um, of course, there's on the one hand and on the other hand, you know, sorry, I won't fall into that trap today. But some people do suggest that all it is is we're at the tail end of the crisis, and that crisis is still limiting growth, Others would say that we may be facing a slower long-term trend. In effect, to the question that I posed, there's at least two identifiable answers emerging. On the one hand, the check is in the mail. But on the other hand, this is about as good as it gets. Well, the real answer is, it's complicated. Uh, now, that's about as funny as an economist can be. And I told them that, that wouldn't, it wouldn't work as a laugh. But anyway, there it is. Both views are part of the story. And so in the time that I have with you today, I'd like to talk about the forces that are holding back economic growth in Canada and in the world. And my hope is that you'll take away a few insights into the bank's analysis of what we're experiencing. And maybe you can make reasonable, more informed financial decisions for yourselves, your families, and of course your businesses your futures, in short. So let's begin with the financial crisis. I mean, as a global event, it's drawn a lot of attention, rightly so. In a very short space of time, global GDP fell by more than 3% in the wake of the crisis. Millions of jobs were lost. Here in Canada, almost half a million jobs were lost. And GDP fell by 4%. Now, the policy response around the world was rapid and it was extraordinary. Policy interest rates were slashed to near zero in many advanced countries. And the economies at the center of the crisis further eased monetary conditions through what we now call quantitative easing. The G20 countries as a group also undertook an unprecedented and concerted fiscal expansion. Now these policies worked really well. There's no doubt about that. No matter how you feel about the final outcome, I think we all recognize that it could have been a lot worse. Indeed, that coordinated policy response may have averted a full-blown global depression. 
Nevertheless, given the passage of time, it is reasonable to ask why growth has not yet returned to pre-crisis trends. Well, one widely accepted explanation is that historically, a recovery following a financial crisis has always taken longer than a recovery in a nor normal business cycle. And according to this view, a period of subdued growth after the crisis can still be regarded as cyclical, in the sense that eventually it will prove to be temporary. But once balance sheets have been repaired, growth should return to its historical trend. Now, bearing in mind, of course, that growth in the United States and in many other parts of the world leading up to the crisis was extraordinarily strong, part of the bubble, if you like. So the true historical trend is really something before that period. <clears throat> Still, given the uncertain timing, what this approach, this interpretation, if you like, reminds me of is that old excuse, well, I'm sorry, but the check is in the mail while well, we're still waiting. But the global economy may not be just suffering from this hangover from the financial crisis. There are other longer-term forces at work as well. And some analysts are suggesting that we may be facing a long period of what they call secular stagnation. Now, on this alternative view, the economy could perform well below normal, leaving many out of work or underemployed for a long time to come. As business people, you need to understand that possibility. You need to know how much weight to put on it. As a central banker, obviously, I need to understand it as well. So let's dive in. Think about this. The long-term economic growth is driven by two factors. The first is growth in the supply of labor. That's connected to population growth and changes in the composition of population, or what we call demographics. And second, productivity growth, which is economist shorthand for how efficiently we produce goods and services. So just to illustrate, if we had 2% trend growth in the supply of labor and 1% trend growth in productivity, trend growth for the economy would be about 3%. Very good. <laughs> then see how simple it is, right? It's, you know, it's, it's not like uh, account, accounting is a lot harder. <laughs> uh, now, productivity is fodder for a speech all on its own. So I'm not going to impose that on you. But I'll just quickly summarize how it fits in, and then we're going to expand mainly on the demographic forces at work. Productivity growth fluctuates around a long-term trend, like many economic concepts. It tends to be weak during recessions and in the early stages of a recovery. And then it's stronger in periods of full expansion. So it all averages out. So it follows, then, that the weakness in productivity growth that we've seen since the, product, since the financial crisis may just be a symptom of a post-crisis hangover. So indeed, in Canada, the latest data show a pickup in productivity in the second half of 2013 to around 2%, which is very promising. So the bank's outlook for the next couple of years is that uncertainty in the business sector will continue to dissipate. And that will boost investment and new firm creation and then productivity growth will outpace its 30-year 30 30 year average for a while. Well, that's productivity. The other significant ingredient of our potential economic growth, as I said, is the labor force. So let's turn to demographics, and we'll start with one immovable fact and one quick reminder. So the fact is, uh, we are all getting older each day. I, I know that's a surprise to many of you. And it sounds like, well, we already knew that. How's that important? Well, the second thing is that the baby boom generation, and yes, I count myself firmly among them, is Canada's largest population cohort, a very big group. Now, the demographic story is often told as one about the labor force. So it goes like this. As the boomer generation, us, begins to retire and exits from the workforce, labor's contribution to the potential of the economy declines. Well, that's already underway. Okay? So the oldest baby boomers were born in 1946. Okay? So they're already starting to retire. In 2011, the growth rate of the population of working-age Canadians 
crossed below the growth term of the overall population. That reverses a 50-year trend. The bank expects that by next year, labor's contribution to the potential growth of the economy will be half of what it was just in 2007. So this is a very significant effect. And that's the labor story, just in a nutshell. It's slowing us down. Now there's another dimension to the demographic story, one that gets less attention, but that merits careful consideration to all, to fully understand what the future will hold. <clears throat> As people move through different stages of life, their spending and savings habits change. Think of students out there who are amassing university or college loans. Well, a bit later on, people will enter a family building stage, which normally involves some heavy borrowing for a family home. And as we get older, we tend to take a bit of a breather on the accumulation of debt. We work at paying it back, and we start to put aside some savings. And as we get closer to retirement, people save more, they build up wealth. I see some heads nodding, so uh, people understand that. It's just a normal life cycle. Typically, in the 15 or 20 years before they retire, people are in serious nest-building mode. And as the facts show it, Canadian households, through this process, are indeed getting wealthier, which is a very good thing. Data released just last month show that despite the financial crisis, despite the Great Recession that followed it, net worth rose noticeably across all age groups in Canada from 1999 through 2012. Now, let's bring the boomers into the picture. Now, they're called boomers for a reason. It's not because of the music they listen to, okay? It's a huge wave, okay, of that generation that simply overwhelms the charts on population. So they're born between 1946 and 1964, so the youngest boomers are turning 50 this year, a very significant year in anybody's life cycle. I remember mine like it was yesterday. <laughs> and so right now, what we're seeing is a very predictable very predictable demographic bulge of more people putting away more savings. So this is simply mother nature at work. And it's where things get interesting. So what does a central banker care? Well, first, the financial decisions made by individuals are, of course, important to those individuals. But when a large swath of the population is making similar decisions at the same time, the impact on the broader economy can be significant. So you need to understand that just to interpret it. But second, where individuals decide to store their wealth also matters quite a great deal. Now, Canadians, I'm sure it won't surprise you, love their houses. We put a lot of our wealth in real estate. This practice preceded the crisis, and it was reinforced by it. You might recall, even may have been your experience, in the 1990s, it was a bit different. The share of household wealth that was in financial assets, such as equities and so on, was increasing much faster than in real estate. But since then, real estate has become more attractive and has grown as a share of total household assets. You know, we had the dot-com bust, and we had Enron and other corporate scandals. They're in the rearview mirror now. But we also had really low interest rates helping to keep mortgage payments very manageable and the sense of cocooning. I know you've heard of that, but it's, it's a trend that we see in this population. So housing in this context is seen as a safe and attractive investment, and no wonder. So for the sector as a whole, real estate assets accounted for 40% of total wealth in 2012. And we went back to 1999, it was more like 32%. It's a really big change in the share of total Canadian wealth. Now, economists have their own way of interpreting these trends. We see some forms of assets primarily as a store of value, a place to keep your money, while others work through the system and they fund investments and they add to the productive potential of the economy. Now, savings that fund infrastructure and business investment are being put to work, which can help improve productivity, while savings that go into housing are, well, they're seen as contributing less to productive potential understandably. So this shift toward housing was also evident in many developed countries before the crisis hit. It's not just Canada. And therefore, it could be contributing to that slower growth rate for productivity that we see overall. 
Now, importantly, the fallout from the financial crisis worked to magnify some of these effects. So it's only logical to expect that secular trends and cyclical fluctuations will interact with each other. And this is certainly true of the demographics, savings trend, and the crisis. Now, as I mentioned, the crisis walloped global demand. It opened up a huge and persistent uncertainty wedge that has held down global demand for business-fixed investment. In many countries, the crisis also triggered household and bank deleveraging, not to mention fiscal consolidation. And as a result, there has been a crisis-induced increase in savings at a global level. There already was a demographics-driven desire for higher savings in advanced economies, and we've heard of massive inflows of savings from emerging markets, and then, through this widespread deleveraging process, the crisis added an extra boost to the world's aggregate savings. So when everybody's saving more, what happens to spending? What this translates into is weaker aggregate demand at a global level. Now, as a trade-dependent economy, Canada feels these effects directly. Weak global demand is limiting the growth of our exports. And the associated uncertainty is holding back business investment in structures, in equipment, and in software. In other words, demographic forces and the lingering hangover from the financial crisis, both are pulling in the same direction, putting limits on our growth possibilities. Now, you can see that I've slowly come around to answering my own question about why this matters to a central banker. It's not just because we care, which let me assure you we do, but in order for us to do our job properly, we need to understand all the dynamics that are feeding into the Canadian economy, and importantly, how our own policy measures will affect the outcomes. So in Canada, low policy interest rates motivated Canadians to invest even more in real estate. And you could say that the Canadian recovery was due to the reinforcing of activity that was already underway, thanks to those underlying demographic forces. But we all know that we can't sustain economic growth in Canada based on housing alone. Our belief is that the post-crisis hangover in the United States is dissipating. Momentum is building. And this will inevitably lead to more Well, it does bear deeper analysis, but it's obvious that the weather had a contributing effect. Similarly, on the inflation front, we've had a couple of months recently of slightly stronger core inflation, which is reassuring, because as you know, we've been some concern about the downside risks to inflation. However, most analysts are expecting softer inflation data later this week, and that's mainly because of a sharp movement in inflation a year ago, in February of last year. So looking through these short-term fluctuations, the volatility, inflation still seems to be running at about the 1.2% uh, zone, give or take a tenth or two. So while we expect growth to approach 2.5% over the next couple of years, we also see the economy's potential capacity growing at an average of around 2%. And that's why we say it'll take a couple of years for us to close the excess capacity gap and get inflation back near our 2% target. Now, looking beyond that, what we would expect, normally the economy would converge on its potential growth rate, which, as I said, is around 2%. And it would be made up of 1% to 1.5% growth in productivity and a gradually declining contribution from the labor force growth driven by this demographic story that I outlined earlier. Accordingly, if it were not for our demographic outlook, our growth would converge on a higher trend line. 
So this is the sense in which demographic forces help define our limits to growth. In the broader global economy, however, the possibility of secular stagnation needs to be taken seriously. The combination of low demand and low investment and high savings could be having an impact on what economists refer to as the Wicksellian rate. I know, I know, that's named after somebody named Wicksell. Someday, will there be a Polazian something or other? <laughs> Doubtful, but anyway, what we mean by the Wicksellian rate is the equilibrium real rate of interest. So these forces are probably pushing it down. Now there's a rigorous theory behind this notion, which I'm gonna spare you. But the important thing for us is it suggests that interest rates may remain lower than we've experienced in the past for a longer period until some of these longer term forces that I've talked about actually dissipate. Now one specific consequence of that would be that even extraordinarily low policy interest rates could prove to be less stimulative to the economy than in normal circumstances. Now in the G20 meetings, which were held recently in Sydney, Australia, we recognize that the global economy has not yet returned to a strong, sustainable, balanced growth path. And that in fact, there's limited scope for further stimulus from conventional policies. So it was in that context that we underscored the importance of what we call structural reforms to future growth. Now to make that notion concrete, the G20 set out an aspiration to collectively boost global GDP by 2% over the next five years. That's the level of GDP. So that would be about 0.4% per year in growth terms on average over those five years. Now maybe that doesn't sound like much, it's just a decimal point. But it would add about two trillion US dollars of income to the world. That's a lot of income, especially when it arrived more or less for free. It would come from countries removing structural impediments to growth. Impediments would include things like trade barriers, labor market rigidities, other factors that make economies inefficient. Now, if your car has an issue that's preventing it from running at top speed, or top efficiency. You either arrive late or you waste a lot of fuel getting there. Now, economies are very much the same. Structural impediments impose limits to growth and removing them can redefine our limits to growth. Now the goal of raising global GDP by an extra 2% over the next five years is a reasonable aspiration and Canada certainly shares it. As a small open economy, we have the opportunity to garner more growth from abroad by building our international Lots of economies growing faster than ours. And we can position ourselves to catch those tailwinds, which will help us overcome some of the domestic demographic constraints on demand. Now we can do this now, but our various free trade agreements are falling into place. We'll be able to do it even more effectively. And as our exports strengthen and confidence improves, increased business investment and the creation of brand new businesses will help raise our productivity and counterbalance some of the demographic constraints on labor supply. Other structural changes can also contribute in this way. Improving competitiveness is a very important fact. Removing barriers to interprovincial trade, the migration of workers, increasing investments in education, training, infrastructure, to name a few. The effect of any of these structural changes, in effect, is win, win, win. So companies win because they can plan better and grow their businesses faster. Consumers win in the form of employment growth and reduced uncertainty. And governments win because higher growth automatically makes fiscal planning easier. Now raising our trend growth rate here in Canada by only 0.1 or 0.2 percentage points per year through such structural reforms would mean an income boost of $25,000 to $50,000 over a typical 30-year career. And I think that's certainly worth having. So let me wrap up. 
<clears throat> over 40 years ago, the Club of Rome published a book entitled The Limits to Growth. Actually, I brought mine with me. And it's such a cool book. It actually does fit in your pocket, <laughs> like a pocket book is supposed to. Um, I bought that in my first year at Queens. It was required reading in my uh, first economics class in 1974. And I noticed an interesting thing here. This is, of course, uh, it's kind of an old book now, 40 years old, right? I still have the receipt here. <laughs> I guess I used it as a bookmark. <clears throat> but anyway, it cost $1.50. Good deal. Still works. Anyway, to the global think tank, those limits were finite natural resources and the environment. Those were our key limits to growth. And although the timing remains uncertain, as it was back then, uh, the arguments that are made there remain relevant today from that perspective. But within that growth envelope, we have the ability to define our own limits to growth. The financial crisis was nearly calamitous. And we are still working to overcome its after effects with both macroeconomic policies and a new global financial architecture. But we continue to believe that the world economy is healing and that Canada will benefit in the form of stronger exports. And from there, we expect to see more investment and new firm creation, the true seeds of sustainable growth. This is going to permit the emergence of a natural, sustained growth trajectory for Canada and a return of inflation to our 2% target. But the demographic forces that are in play suggest that the growth trajectory that we will converge on after the recovery period will be slower than our historical trend. And it will be associated with lower equilibrium rates of interest than we're used to. Now, fortunately, global policymakers have the ability to redefine the limits to growth by removing growth impediments. But as business people, and investors, we must keep those efforts in perspective. The world remains a very complicated place. And there may be implications for your businesses, for your personal savings, your investment plans. But I hope I've been able to add your understanding today. I thank you very much and good messi. Well, thank you very much for your remarks, Governor. I, I appreciate you uh, said it was complicated, but even for those of us who weren't economists or accountants, I think uh, a lot of value out of that. <clears throat> I guess it's also insightful to learn that the uh, things we're encouraging our members to do, and as we do as small business people and big business people like to uh, invest in our companies and export and high rents and all those things serve not only our own immediate needs, but serve a grander cause of uh, national growth. Um, so we do have some questions that are coming off the floor. Okay. Hope they're, hope they're good questions. <laughs> Easy questions. I guess we'll find out. There we go. <clears throat> okay, we're going to uh, go to an international stage and ask uh, how concerned should we be, uh, and I think given your heritage, you might have a particular insight to this, how concerned should we be relative to the crisis in uh, Crimea and in the Ukraine mm. right now? Uh, yes, well, it's true. My Polaz is a Ukrainian name, so there is a connection back there, but I'm a quarter Polish, and then I got Stephen, which is Scottish, and uh, Gallagher, which is Irish, so I wore a green tie yesterday. <laughs> um, but anyway, regardless of heritage, uh, this, of course, is uh, a very significant event on the landscape. Uh, it's very early days in the sense, thinking of it as an economist and how it may uh, impact us um, if we if we just sort of walk through the sort of chain of analysis that we would look to uh, we have a shock there of course it's a relatively small economy and nevertheless it's an economy with uh, loans in European banks and others and so does Russia and so there are connections to banking sectors so you can imagine there being spillovers from that crisis into global banking systems and then into national economies. That would be the sequence that we would be analyzing as we go on. Um, so at this stage, uh, there's not much to work with on that, but that exactly the things that we'll be monitoring as we go along. And uh, of course, like everyone, we're hoping uh, that things turn out 
Peace Boy. Okay. Thank you. Uh, somewhat related question. Uh, only two years ago, the European crisis was in the news every day. Italy, Spain, Portugal, etc. Uh, we no longer hear about Europe as much as we used to. Um, what is the, uh, where is Europe's uh, economic and banking status as of today, and why are we not hearing more about it? Uh, well, I will say at least that the Bank of Canada hasn't stopped talking about it. So when we, we have uh, two flagship uh, studies that come out. The, the monetary policy report, which is quarterly, and to complement it is the financial stability review. And so it's about the risks as opposed to the, the policy document, which is about what the world looks like and how interest rates will, will be. So the financial stability review still has Europe as the number one risk uh, that we face globally. And so that has not gone away. But, uh, but it's, there's no question that uh, the longer things go on, the, the more confident you come to feel because you, the, the oft-predicted disaster simply, they manage it somehow. So that's a reassuring process. It just seems to take longer than you would hope when it, when it began. Um, so no question that Europe has, uh, economically, has bottomed out. So I uh, picture this as there's a global bubble and then there's a crisis and then there's a crater and they're down around the bottom of the crater, which is not a great place to be, very high unemployment and so on. And showing signs of climbing their way out, which is encouraging, but that remains fragile. It could be interrupted perhaps, you know, with the Ukrainian situation, that kind of thing. So it's not assured, um, but as the rebuilding process uh, is occurring and the banks seem to be in better and better shape. They've just begun the asset quality review, um, which is a really important uh, element of that supervision. And meanwhile, the entire world is, is putting together a, a stronger financial architecture. The regulatory constraints under which banks operate has changed dramatically. I can guarantee you it's safer today than it was in 2007. Um, and so all of that is uh, still a movie that isn't finished, but showing a promise. So Europe hasn't gone away, but at least it's, you know, it's got the right the direction, right? It's got the dynamic that we're, we're happy about. Okay, thank you. Uh, staying on the uh, global theme, let's uh, go to another continent. We have a new trade deal with South Korea, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, non-auto exporters or like beef farmers are excited and the auto industry is not as excited. Uh, what, what is the impact on that and what will the impact be on the, uh, on the automobile sector? Well, I think that uh, as a trading nation, uh, we should always be ready to applaud and encourage efforts to liberalize trade. Uh, I think those, those of us who uh, work in these businesses know perfectly well it's a win-win situation. Both sides uh, win. Um, of course, it can lead to periods of adjustment for certain companies. An example might be the the effect of tariff that is in place now on a Korean car is on the order of 4%. So we're talking about when you go to the dealer and you're comparing you, you know, a Korean car to a domestic car it would be all the things equal, 4%. And I think if that 4% went away, it's, it's not a major change to that uh, picture. But there are other sectors where the changes are much greater. So for example, on um, uh, Meat, well, pork exports in particular, I know that when the U.S. free trade deal went into effect, Canada's exports of pork to Korea fell dramatically. We were still negotiating. So now that levels the playing field. So you'd expect to see those kinds of growth, other foods like seafood and stuff like this. I don't know all the numbers about the So all to say that uh, there, uh, you could like, you could talk all day about that, and I don't even have enough information to do it. But but combing through it, just look at the big picture: is that um, uh, liberalized trade is one of those things that kind of, if you like, allows growth to happen, as opposed to forcing growth to happen, which is what we try to do with other policies in the crisis. So we need to transform into business-led growth, natural growth, as opposed to fueled, policy-fueled growth, and that's exactly the kind of thing I'm talking about. So it's a very, very positive development overall. And if, if things cost less because the imports cost less, 
You know, if you spend, uh, I don't know, if you spent $1,000 a year on things from Korea, I don't know, well, maybe more because TVs or whatever, you might spend. So now if you save a bit of money on things you buy from Korea, what are you going to do with the money? You're going to spend it. And so that, that's the income effect that people don't talk about very much. It's the most important part of trade liberalization is that you have more income. Never mind that more of that. Everybody is richer on both sides of the deal. Very good. So I think we have time for one last question, a little bit closer to home. Okay. So uh, <clears throat> I know you're speaking from more of a national and global perspective, but what suggestions do you have for us as a province or region to uh, help us improve our economy in the long term? Well, um, there's certainly, uh, when, when I talk about the stresses and the forces that are acting, uh, they're, they're, those are things that we all share. Uh, those are uh, those macro stories that uh, are present in every province. In some provinces, they may be even more significant than in others. That's, that's quite possible. But they're all there no matter what. So in that context, uh, uh, we continue to deal with a changed world. The crisis did change the world. It's not just a fluctuation. Uh, oil prices look like they're maybe permanently higher than they were in the old days. And that has an important impact on Canada and causes uh, forces to act throughout the economy. In effect, we have two speeds to our economy, the, the resource slash energy sector and other sectors. And as that goes on, as recovery happens, both of those lines strengthen, which is great. The average goes up. But we're still left with the fact that there are two speeds. Okay, so kind of a headwind underneath for the, for the slower speed. And so, you know, the thing with Nova Scotia is you've got this diversity of opportunity, which is there, which, you know, I could say, tell a whole story about Canada and say, might as well, that's, that's Nova Scotia, because there's some of everything. So I do think, uh, besides the fact that it's just wonderful being here, uh, it's, it's got all that opportunity. So it's all about what you do with it. I think if you just take the lesson about policies in general that, that are either helpful should be, I think, kind of fundamental in thinking. How does this help business do its thing? If it's facilitative, then I think policy can really help a lot. And so uh, that's kind of the general lesson, but I don't have a specific recommendation for you. Uh, but I'll just keep coming back and checking on your progress. Okay. Well, we look forward to that. Okay. I think, uh, I think we've taken up your time uh, today enough on, uh, out of your busy schedule to come see us. We appreciate it. Um, on behalf of your time today, the Chamber will be making a donation to the charity of your choice, and you've selected the uh, local chapter of the United Way. Appreciate that. Okay. Uh, I understand before we leave today that you and others will uh, be given a uh, hand. So, uh, without further ado, appreciate Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. <laughs>